One of the things that Jesus left us with were the powerful words of seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness from Matthew chapter 6 verse 33. And we are left with the trajectory that Jesus gives to us. Number one is to seek first the kingdom of God, heavenly values. And number two, his righteousness. And today we're going to look at what his righteousness is. How do you understand God's righteousness? How do we seek after his righteousness? And how do we live and manifest his righteousness on this earth? Paul tells us in the book of Ephesians, when he talks about spiritual warfare and the challenges that faithful people, followers of Jesus, face in this battle, in this challenge, in the battlefield of spiritual salvation, where the forces of good and evil, dark and light, are opposing and we are called to overcome and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And so Paul tells us in Ephesians 6 to put on the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. In other words, if you go back to Psalm 23, or the, the psalmist says to the Lord, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. In other words, the fellowship and the communion that we have with the Lord epitomized at the Lord's Supper, the bread, the wine, the foot washing, the intimacy, the covenant, the breaking of bread, the participating in the, the shed blood of Jesus, is in the presence of our enemies. In other words, the fellowship that you and I have with the Lord is on a battlefield. And then Jesus tells us that we must be victors in him, that we have conquering. He who ever conquers, says Jesus, he who overcomes is another translation. I will grant to sit with me on my throne, even as I conquered, says Jesus, and sat down with my father on his throne. So the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness, what does that mean? How do we live it? How do we walk this? How do we understand it? And how are we transformed by seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness? Because in today's world, we have a, a pseudo set of righteousness. It's called rights. And you hear a lot of people fighting for their rights, whatever that means. Now, you hear rights both in the terms of good rights and negative self-indulgent rights. I want to talk about that. For example, we hear about unions fighting for the rights of workers, better opportunity, better con conditions, better wages. We hear about women and the feminist movement fighting for bodily autonomy. In other words, the right to kill the baby who's in their womb. They're fighting for it. And the Roe versus Wade case since the 1970s has not subsided and the Supreme Court in the United States is discussing it again. What about indigenous rights and land rights? What about gay and transgender rights? We hear about it everywhere, including in pre-primary and kindergarten at school. And they're at the core of the fabric of Western society today, where there's a lot of people fighting for their rights. But there's also rights that are honourable. For example, the right to free speech. That's at the heart of Judeo-Christian ethos. It's the heart of healthy democracy, the capacity to robustly enter into conversation and discuss and wrestle and try to find some sort of consensus through freedom of speech and the right to freedom of speech. And of course, I mentioned abortion before, there are movements that work for the right of the preborn, that everybody is created in the image and likeness of God and everybody has the right to life. But of course, if you take God out of the equation and you believe in your own personal life that he doesn't exist and there's no higher transcendent moral virtue, then to kill someone has no, there's no evil in that. That's just part of the suffering of the great cosmos, the the moments of consciousness that we don't fully understand between two oblivions. Who cares whether I'm killed or somebody else is killed? But when you believe that there is reason, purpose, identity in a noble, personable God, a sense of transcendent being to whom we are ultimately answerable to, 
then that changes the trajectory of your heart and my heart in a very powerful way because we see the idea of rights right throughout the scripture. Contending for the rights of somebody else or yourself is in alignment with scripture. For example, Paul appealed to the right that he had as a Roman citizen and he was treated differently because of his citizenship rights. And here in Australia, as an Australian under federal constitutional law, I have the right to freedom to travel right across this country without hindrance if I'm a law-abiding citizen. And, but we know that that doesn't always practically play out as idealized, for example, in a constitution. There's always the caveats and the unexpected aspects. And so that we look at that and we recognize the precariousness of human life, even though it's a fine-tuned, beautiful, God-created universe, we live in a world of beauty and order and design, but evil and wickedness and chaos and destruction. And the north and the south, the sheep and the goats, the wheats and the tares, the light and the dark are always at this continual contention and opposing views. And we see that precariousness in the suffering of life. That as beautiful and wonderfully created as we are, because of the brokenness and sin and destruction and wickedness at the heart of human beings, inspired by the prince of the power of the air, human life, human history has been written in blood. And it's been one of suffering for, for, for millennia, as far back as we can find human history. But I want to look at the subject of rights and righteousness and understand and hopefully today have a greater, clearer understanding because the Bible does speak about rights, not necessarily our rights, but the rights of others, those whom we know, and it's within our power to enter into advocacy. Proverbs 31 verses 8 to 9 says, Open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all who are destitute. So you're doing okay, and you have a responsibility that you can speak, you can advocate, and therefore you see someone, a friend, a brother, or somebody in the community who is destitute. You must open your mouth for the mute, those who are less able to express themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Verse 9, open your mouth. Judge righteously. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. And you look at the book of James, Jesus' brother, he talks about caring for widows and orphans that has been the heart of Christian ministry, the heart of the fabric of society, of caring for those less fortunate. Isaiah chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. Woe to those who make unjust laws, to those who issue oppressive decrees, to deprive the poor of their rights and withhold justice from the oppressed of my people, making widows their prey and robbing the fatherless. So you can have a functioning society that creates laws and legislation that oppress people and deprive them of their rights. So we get the idea in the biblical narrative, and there's many more scriptures similar to these that I can quote, that actually speak of our proactive involvement in helping create a just and equitable society by engaging not necessarily for what we perceive to be our rights, but engaging for the rights of others. And therein, the narrative of what righteousness looks like can be understood with greater clarity. It is important for those of us gifted by the Spirit and the capacity to articulate in speech to become advocates for the poor and the needy and the voiceless of society. And it's been something that I've been meditating on for quite some time. We have an example in Scripture where Jesus Christ is the Word, the Logos, the one who spoke everything into existence on behalf of his Father, for all things are created for the Father through Jesus. And Jesus is our advocate, sometimes referred to as a high priest, between us and the Father. No one can come to the Father except through Jesus. And this reality that he, we have a high priest who's not able to not empathize with our weaknesses, who was tested and tried in every way that we were, we are, yet Jesus is without sin and so he has the right to come before the Father on our behalf as an advocate. And you and I, 
then therefore extend that same grace to others less fortunate, the voiceless, the widows, the orphans, those who are destitute, as Scripture says. In other words, to speak up, to be an advocate and be a voice for the truth. We talked a little bit earlier about the belt of truth and the breastplate of light righteousness. Both are very important, and they both work together in a very powerful way. Now, I want to also consider the idea of, we've talked about fighting and working and advocating for the rights of those less fortunate. There's a challenge that we face when we seek our rights, and we hear a lot about that in Western dialogue today. The challenge with seeking our rights in a, in a world in a Western world where we have a right to justice, a, a right to so many areas, is that it can easily slide us into the devil's territory of entitlement. It is my right to say this or do this or to claim this, and therefore I will claim or do or pursue that particular right. And I want to show that. Because what we're doing then is that we are in the eyes of our peers validating our right to a certain disposition. When we intercede and advocate for the rights of others who are suffering, who are less fortunate than us, then we become an advocate for righteousness. So when it's about us, there's a risk of entitlement. When it's about somebody else, you are risking your own personal autonomy to swim against the, the sea, the tide, to speak against the jeering crowd in order for righteousness' sake that the poor and the unfortunate have a voice and an advocate. It's very powerful. We can always risk our rights for the rights of others. And that's a very powerful position to think about how we live our lives, because suffering for righteousness' sake is necessary in a blinded, deluded, wicked world. If we always fly below the radar and never speak up, injustices can occur and, can occur, and we are guilty then of the sin of omission. We could have done something good and holy, right and just, and we failed to do so. And the whole idea of rights and righteousness is a misunderstood issue. It needs thinking through. What do we mean by righteousness versus rights? What's it actually in this phrase? Because it's easy to talk about the righteousness, you know, um, a level of righteousness. You know, rights are important. What I want to say is that righteousness is of utmost importance. And we'll explore that as we look at today's message today. The word righteousness appears about almost 280 times in Scripture. And it's often referred to in God's righteousness or His righteousness. And the first reference of righteousness appears in Genesis. Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. Abraham believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. In other words... Abraham and Sarah were aging. They didn't have any children. God made an extraordinary promise of a firstborn son. Who'd, and they were well past childbearing age. And God says, Abraham, look at the stars of the sky. So shall your descendants be by the child of promise. And at that moment, Abraham believed God. Despite his physical incapacity and his wife's physical incapacity to bear children. And God accounted to him as righteousness. And Paul picks this up. Romans chapter 4 verse 3. For what does scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. In verse 4. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. So Paul is talking about a level of righteousness based on faith in the Lord, trusting his word when everything else around you seems impossible. 
And that to God is really precious. Because when you truly believe God that he exists and that he's a God of love and purpose and that we are image bearers of, of, of deity, we are children of God one day to be raised in glory, then that transcendent reality of being, of worship, of adoration, of aspiring to changes us. We seek his righteousness. We seek his heavenly realm and that transforms us to bring every thought into the obedience and captivity of Christ. We are no longer our own. We were bought with a price. And you and I understand this. But the reality is, is we are told that no matter how hard we try, it falls short and is not counted as righteousness. But our capacity to receive Jesus and believe in his name gives us the right to become children of God. And this kind of transcendent, extraordinary face in the unseen, transcendent reality of being, in the Logos, in what God is accomplishing, changes us. We become fertile ground for his spirit, his Holy Spirit, and therefore we are viewed in God's eyes as righteous, simply by faith. And that's a very powerful concept that undergirds the new covenant that we have in Christ. Now, before we go any further, you may say, well, how do you define righteousness? Well, according to the Hebrew and the Greek, it's listed as rightness, as in terms of justice and virtue, that which is altogether just, as opposed to unjust. It can refer to equity of character, but for the Christian, under the terms of the New Covenant, justification gives us, by Jesus' blood, gives us his righteousness. Not our righteousness, but his righteousness. You know, we are attributed righteousness by faith, just like Abraham was. Now, Abraham then followed up with obedience. He was commanded to circumcise, so that's what he did. He was commanded by the words of God who kept, and so Abraham is recorded as having kept all the laws and judgments and statutes of God faithfully. But he did all that after he was attributed as righteous. So the righteousness by faith existed before the Old Covenant and after the Old Covenant. I want to look at that, the overt references to righteousness. Listen to as Paul writes in Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 21. But now the righteousness of God Paul first refers to righteousness as the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, though the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Do you believe? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who redeems us from certain sin and death? Are you willing to surrender to this personable, knowable Jesus? Are you willing to bring every thought into captivity and obedience to Christ? That everything that you say and do is in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? Then you are accounted as righteous. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Verse 25, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. In other words, our sins were paid for by the shedding of Jesus' blood on that cross to be received by faith. The scriptural narrative tells us the greatest attribute that we can have is faith in God, faith in who he is, faith in the power of redemption and salvation in Jesus Christ and the justification that makes us right before God. Abraham believed God and it was accredited to him as righteousness. We're told in the book of Isaiah, chapter 54, I think it is, or 52, remember the rock from where you were who, hewn? In other words, follow in the steps of Abraham. This was to show God's righteousness. Again, a term, God's righteousness. Because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be the just, be just 
and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. That's awesome. That's extraordinary for you and I. The power of believing faith. When you look all around you and you see troubled waters, but you fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, the one who began a good work in us will bring it to completion. You believe that. You believe that one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. That's the trajectory. That's the defining reality of where you're going, where this whole world is going. When Jesus says, I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. That's the transcendent reality, even though it doesn't look like it now. But you and I wake up every morning and live every day in that kind of faith. And that's the sort of faith that's valuable to our Heavenly Father. I want to talk, um, I want to go back a little bit about rights and righteousness and give an Old Testament example from the time of King, from Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 24. The first king of Israel was Saul. He was a tall, handsome man. And during his kingship, he departed from God and his life was troubled. He ended up being afflicted by the demonic. And the demonic would send him into fits of rage and anger and jealousy. And so the scene is set that a young man from the tribe of Benjamin, from the tribe of Judah, um, Jesse had a son called David. Samuel came and anointed him and said that he would be the next king of Israel. But for a long time after that, even though David knew that he was going to be king, he and his small band of men fled for their lives because the incumbent king was jealous and angry. And we find the scene in En Gedi at the wild goat's rocks. So David had been fleeing and Saul and his army surrounds David at En Gedi. And, um, and the jealousy is spurned. I remember David killed Goliath. He tried to wear Saul's armor, but it was too heavy. So David took it off. He went and selected five stones from the brook and killed this great battle-hardened warrior, Goliath. And as the ancient Israelites were celebrating this victory, it's recorded that they sang out joyous songs of Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed ten thousands. And this gave rise, instead of Saul celebrating a young warrior who was valuable to the narrative of Israel, Saul saw him as an opponent and in jealous fits of rage wanted to kill him. And so David knew that he was being king. I want to read this from 1 Samuel 24, chapter 3. And as, as he came to the sheepfold's way, there was a cave and Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. It's a beautiful story. It's a challenging story. You wonder whether a movie could be made of this particular scene. And the men of David said to him, Here is the day which the Lord has said to you. And so David's men who are battle-hardened warriors tells David and actually quotes scripture. He says, Behold, I will give your enemy into your hand and you shall do to him as it seems good to you. So David rises, takes his sword to the sleeping king Saul and stealthily cuts off a corner of Saul's robe. And afterward, David's heart struck him. He realized what he was doing because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And he said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. Now, even though David was anointed to be king, he recognized that Saul was still incumbent. And he could have easily taken that sword and plunged it into his heart and killed Saul because Saul was a, a man out of control. So David persuaded his men in verse 7 with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. Because they could have then suggested, oh, David, you're weak. The best that you could do was snip off a piece of his robe. Wow, why don't you use that sword for what it's meant to be? And so Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way. And afterwards David also rose and went out of the cave and called after Saul, My Lord, the King! And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed his face to the earth and paid homage. And David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of the men who say, Behold, David seeks your harm? 
Behold, this day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today in my hand in the cave, and someone told me to kill you. But I spared you, and I said, I will not put out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, see the corner of the robe in my hand? For by the fact that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you, you may know and see that there's no wrong or treason in my hands. I haven't sinned against you, though you hunt my life to take it. And so at that moment, Paul, Saul is so compassionate and he says, David, my son, you're more righteous than me. I know you're going to be future king. But um, Saul's benevolence at that moment didn't last very long. And so you see a case where David was authorized and had a right to the throne. Instead, he chooses to be a fugitive and run for his life, even when he had the moment to raise his sword against his enemy. He chose righteousness over rights because he had a right to the throne. And the scripture was quoted there. You know, you can do what you like. I've given the enemy in your hands. What does that look like in today's life? In the circumstances that we find ourselves in? Well, a few weeks ago, I traveled by motorcycle because I'm not vaccinated. I've made an informed choice based on a lot of input not to go that path. And with good reason. So I couldn't fly by aircraft. So I traveled by motorcycle some 3,800 kilometers from Perth to Sydney, right across this great continent. And, and you, you and I know now, the science is clear, that the vaccinated and the unvaccinated are just as contagious with this coronavirus. So when legislation comes out, albeit uninformed, it's still civil government saying we don't want any vaccinate, unvaccinated people returning into our state. So we are deploying police at the border to check the vaccination status of everybody entering the state. And so I found myself unable to return home, thousands of kilometers away from home and thousands of kilometers away from where I'd left. And so you begin to understand that we live in an increasingly secular, godless society governed by coercion, control and exclusion. There's no justice. And so I found myself facing the police and entering into dialogue with the men who I had great concern for because many of them are conscionable, honest, hardworking men who are supporting and enforcing a law that they find themselves reprehensible and morally wrong. And so I feel for them. Anyway, at the time, I, you know, the law was wrong. The law was ill-conceived. It was punitive. It lacked compassion. In fact, one of the policemen said, he said, well, you've got to head back. Go and sleep in the bush. Um, there was no compassion in this particular law. So for me, standing there in no man's land, I could see an egregious failure of civil government simply to prop up an unjust and unworkable solution. Thankfully, the border's gone down, the light of the day has seen, and everyone's free to travel again. I'm glad to be back home again. I'm glad to be back in the studio. But some weeks ago, a month or so ago, I stood at that border and it was my right to return home. In fact, Australian federal constitution decrees that every Australian has the freedom of travel unhindered across all the states. And I've enjoyed, I think I've ridden the motorcycle across the country some seven or eight times now in 45 years. And so I've enjoyed that. So for me, unable to return home, it was my right. But while I was within my rights to return home, I would have broken the law. I would have achieved nothing but an arrest, a criminal or a civil record against me, a heavy fine. Um, several people were taken in a paddy van and locked up in prison in Kalgoorlie. And I would have had a police record. And I would have viewed that as suffering for righteousness sake. The Bible talks a lot about suffering for righteousness sake, uh, not to be afraid of it. But in the multitude of counsel, in the multitude of wisdom, there's understanding. And I came to the consensus that I had a choice. Number one, I could break the law because it was my right. Look, there's state law, federal law and divine law. And I was within my rights 
to go back to my home. Or I had to turn around and travel back, I don't know, nearly 3,000 kilometres back to Sydney, where I had just come from, some 30 hours away. It was a hard choice, because as a follower of Jesus Christ, I will only break the law when it contravenes the law of God. Now, this civil law was wrong, it was punitive, it was unjust, it was ex exclusive in nature for no scientific or medical reason. But the law didn't contravene God's law as I understood it. And I am a law-abiding citizen. So the path of righteousness was to turn the motorcycle around and travel back the distance I had come, thousands of kilometres. And that's where our rights are superseded by a higher transcendent view. See, the reason why I think righteousness is more important than rights, it's not about us. When you take a stand for righteousness, you are giving voice to the voiceless, to other people who would love to have the moral fortitude to take a stand, but unfortunately can't. There are many people who did not, who took the coronavirus vaccination, not because they were worried about sickness. They were worried about their mortgage and they were worried about losing their employment. That's the only reason they weakened, because they were slaves to a financial economy. And a lot of people take great courage when they see a somebody stand up for the sake of righteousness, even if they deny themselves. What did Jesus say? If anyone would like to come after me, let him deny himself and pick up his cross and follow me. What does it mean to deny yourself, to deny your rights and follow Jesus? We have a responsibility to speak on behalf of others, to use the gifts and grace that God has given to us as image bearers of the Logos, to speak in wisdom, in grace and truth that others can stand stronger. See, when you pursue rights rather than righteousness, you are being concerned with being correct at any cost so that you are, appear correct in the eyes of man and in the eyes of your own heart. You want justice now. And so you pursue your rights rather than righteousness because it appears good, it looks good, it seems to be morally effable and, and, and acceptable. Righteousness, on the other hand, is being concerned with what God thinks. That's the difference. How many of us are really concerned with what God thinks and are prepared to make the decisions and walk the path, even if it means denial of your personal self? What did Jesus say? Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. You know, food, clothing and shelter, God will provide. How hard it is to swim against the tide. How hard it is to walk the narrow winding road that leads to eternal life. Proverbs 12 verse 28. In the paths of righteousness is life and in its pathway there is no death. Proverbs 16.25, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. The overwhelming message in Scripture is that we are to pursue the paths of righteousness. And the paths of righteousness permeates even the most innocuous, mundane, everything's day things of life. Paul addresses this in Romans 14. He talks about the conflict that brothers and sisters have based on their personal convictions. Some people think every day is holy. Some people think particular days are holy. Some people love a good glass of red wine. Others would never touch alcohol. Paul highlights the fact that some like a good steak and others are vegetarians. And he talks about this creating division and offence within the household and the body of Christ. And there are many different levels of understanding Romans 14, but one of them is... Would you be prepared to forego your juicy steak so that you can accommodate at your same table your vegetarian brother? And Paul lays it out to you, to us, that while it's our right to enjoy a good juicy steak, 
Righteousness means that we would never touch a steak or drink a glass of wine in the company of a brother who would find that morally reprehensible for whatever reasons, whether they're right or wrong. In other words, don't be the cause of stumbling block or offence to your brother. So then you are pursuing a level of righteousness, not your personal rights. You have a right to eat meat. But what's the righteous cause when with your vegetarian brother? Paul addresses this, Romans 14, verse 16. I won't read the whole passage, but he says, Therefore let not your good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Spirit. That's very profound, extremely significant. And sometimes we can be caught up on the mundane, everyday things of life, claim them as our rights, and create offence, even though there's nothing wrong with having a nice steak. First Peter 3.12, as we begin to wrap this up, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. Hold that. God's watching you. He knows the sacrifices and the tears that you make, and he knows the advocacy that you stand up for the rights of others. And his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Philippians chapter 1, beginning in verse 9. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offence till the day of Christ. Without offence because you live the path of righteousness. You live by his righteousness. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So we don't live by our righteousness. We live by his righteousness. By faith in believing God, we are attributed as righteous because of Jesus' sacrifice and his blood-toning sacrifice through his, through his death. And so we have the hope of sharing in his resurrection because of God's righteousness. So we started out, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We talked about putting on the breastplate of righteousness to protect your heart. So that you can truly love God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength. Let Jesus' teaching on this now become our defining attribute, brothers and sisters. Our righteousness should transcend our rights. And the righteousness that we have is God's righteousness. And so we stand in the righteousness of Jesus before our Heavenly Father, and that's a wonderful place to be. And therefore, we must be anchored in Christ, I in Christ and Christ in me. Jesus says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, that's a powerful place to be. So the righteousness of Jesus becomes everything that we say, everything that we do. And so in that righteousness, you and I can speak courageously and freely in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to speak into the brokenness of society, to speak in the welfare of the destitute, the widows, the orphans, in an unjust age, to glorify God by sacrificing our rights. Brothers and sisters, may we be courageous and strong in the Lord Jesus Christ to do just that, to act, to speak, to live, to intercede, to advocate in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and his righteousness. And so in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm your brother, John Classic. <laughs>